Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Maxim, and I work uh, in the Index Infrastructure. And today I'll be talking about Razor coding. And actually, I will try to share with you some of the experience uh, that we gained over uh, the last years designing and implementing some large scale storage systems. And I expect this talk to last throughout an hour by itself. And afterwards, uh, we can have some time for the Q&A session. And also, in case you have any questions, uh, you can ask them uh, uh, in Telegram chat uh, so that we can see them and uh, answer them as well. So um, my talk is um, based mostly on the results achieved uh, by my team uh, in a system called YT. Uh, so I think it makes some sense to spend a couple of minutes uh, to explain uh, what YT is. And, uh, for those uh, who have joined us from abroad, let me say that uh, Yandex, uh, the company uh, where I work, uh, is, a Russian, is a Russian web search company. And actually, it's uh, a lot in Russia with a uh, share about 60%. And uh, apart from uh, the web search itself, of course, uh, we have ads uh, and some other, some other businesses like car sharing, tax aggregation services, food delivery. And uh, we also act as a cloud service provider here in Russia. So YT is uh, the code name for our primary platform that we use to store huge volumes of data and to process that data. So uh, YT project was started about 10 years from now. And today, virtually every team here at Yandex that works with data in some way either uses YT directly or interacts with some other systems that are built on top of YT. And just to give you some intuition about the scale here, uh, let me say that we store about an exabyte of data, actually more than an exabyte already. And uh, the data is of various kinds. Uh, we have uh, logs, we have uh, machine learning models, we have uh, ads data, we have uh, web search indexes, we have images, we have videos. And of course, we do run some computations uh, uh, on top of that data. And these computations uh, totally utilize uh, roughly millions of CPU cores of our clusters. So talking about the compute, uh, the oldest but still widely used API uh, that we have uh, in YT for batch processing uh, was inspired by the MapReduce paradigm. And, but of course, nowadays, uh, this model was vastly extended and uh, some more sophisticated data manipulation primitives uh, are present there. And YT also has a number of uh, real-time features. Uh, for example, it hosts key value storages and that support online updates of data and uh, including multi-row transactions and uh, snapshot isolation uh, semantics. And these storages can serve high rates of uh, range scans and lookups. And these are used among other places, for example, in the index banner system that actually shows you some ads while you scroll through the uh, web search page, web, web, web search result page. And uh, our system is multi-tenant, which is really important uh, in terms of the total cost and we run actually a complex mixture of uh, both ad hoc and production workloads all within a shared uh, num all within a shared uh, set of clusters uh, and this way we achieve something like uh, 70 to uh, 80% of uh, cpu utilization and uh, we're also pretty aggressive on collocating our storage and compute with some other services uh, for example, the web, the web search service, which is one of the largest and, and is extremely latency sensitive, uh, is collocated with uh, YT storage and YT compute. Okay, uh, so as the title uh, of this talk suggests, I'll be focusing on the storage path mostly, and I will tell you very little about the computer itself. Okay. Uh, So sorry. Uh, 
Okay, so um, our high level design is pretty standard. Uh, the data is being stored uh, in a cluster and the cluster consists of uh, nodes, uh, which are some server machines uh, with a number of these drives attached to them. And typically we have uh, about 10 drives uh, per node. And uh, each drive uh, in ranges from one to 10 terabytes in capacity. Uh, in YT, we have uh, HDDs, we have SSDs, we have NVMe drives, and the clients uh, can choose uh, which kind of uh, storage medium they need to use. And of course, they get built for the storage space uh, accordingly. For example, SSDs are considered much more expensive in terms of uh, um, the cost per megabyte. And as I was saying earlier, our largest production clusters uh, have uh, the total disk capacities uh, of roughly an exabyte. So what do we store there? Much of the space is being occupied by tabular data. So tables are collections of rows uh, with some uh, schemers indicating which columns are present in these rows. And the types of columns, like the types of cells of these tables, are known in advance. And uh, this enables some efficient encoding schemes uh, that we use to compress data. But anyway, let's not discuss uh, table storage in details. Um, because it suffices to understand that tables are split into portions called chunks, and each, each chunk is stored and is being managed separately. And uh, these chunks, we call them blob chunks actually, because there are other types of chunks, and I'll be discussing that uh, like a bit later. So these chunks are immutable, and we aim for chunks of pretty big size, like one gigabyte per chunk is a good size. So the size of chunks, the size of chunks matters for us because we've got an exabyte of data to store. So the smaller your chunks are, the more chunks you have. And each chunk is actually annotated with some metadata that we need to store, well, again, somewhere and to handle. Uh, and actually the goal of the control plane and the metadata servers to do that. So in our system, metadata is pretty rich in types. Like we have a namespace tree, which is pretty similar to a file system namespace, uh, which is, you know, uh, we just stores lists of tables, files, uh, and folders, and with various attributes and annotations. And I will not be covering this part since uh, it's unrelated to the storage problems uh, we're going to discuss. For each table, uh, the control plane and the metadata servers uh, keep track of the sequence of chunks comprising that table. And for each chunk, we store its attributes and replica information. So, uh, for an exabyte of total this capacity and one gigabyte per chunk, uh, we get roughly a billion of chunks in total. Uh, so uh, we have to remember, and we have to remember roughly a kilobyte per chunk of its metadata. Hence this, the total size of our metadata uh, is some terabytes. And uh, metadata is uh, memory resident and uh, we apply a certain sharding scheme to it because of course storing just, um, several terabytes in a single machine is, uh, is not feasible. So we shard our metadata, chunk metadata. And uh, we distribute chunks across so-called cells. So each cell acts as a shard. And uh, each cell is responsible for roughly tens of uh, millions of chunks. And uh, each cell is replicated and is served by a group of so-called master servers. And uh, these groups run a REFT-like consensus algorithm to ensure that each cell acts like being managed by just a single machine. And typically uh, we have uh, from five to seven master cells, masters per cell. Uh, so th that's the size of the REFT quorum. And uh, this is to achieve the needed level of fault tolerance. And I'll be talking about the fault tolerance for the chunks themselves uh, in a couple of minutes. 
And again, I'm pretty, I'm skipping these parts pretty fast because they are not very relevant. And while they define a certain context, uh, they are not really very, they are not really very important for the remaining part of the talk. Okay. Um, okay. Besides storing metadata, our so masters also saw various chunk related tasks like chunk replica orchestration. Uh, where you have to decide which nodes will be receiving replicas of newly created chunks. And uh, we also have to handle replica loss due to node failures. And, uh, and you have to start certain replication jobs and nodes to make sure new copies of chunks uh, get created. And uh, so these and other activities often rely on some in-memory state, uh, which is maintained just at draft leaders and uh, is uh, transient thus and uh, but can be re easily reconstructed upon re-election. Okay. Um, now comes the more relevant part. Uh, let's discuss chunk replication. Uh, since erasure coding, uh, which is the subject of this talk actually, can be viewed as a more sophisticated way of replicating data while paying less in terms of uh, storage space and network and disk bandwidth. So uh, why do we need replication after all? Uh, we have a pretty constant rate of hardware failures. So storing just a single chunk replica uh, will be definitely losing data pretty soon. And uh, the golden standard uh, for data replication nowadays is storing uh, three separate copies of your chunks uh, located on uh, distinct nodes. And this incurs a factor of three overhead. Uh, in this setting, however, you can tolerate a simultaneous failure of any of two nodes. Any two nodes can die, and uh, since we have three copies, it's still okay. Uh, but for data uh, that is not that important, you can still go with some lower replication factors. You can use a replication factor of two, for example. And our experience actually indicates that data loss here is possible, but, uh, well, not very probable, so to say. Uh, so, uh, for some kinds of data, it could be still a good choice. And of course, uh, you can also use uh, replication factor of one, but, uh, well, <laughs> uh, this way uh, you are in, in a big trouble and uh, you, you will be losing data pretty fast. Well, returning, going back to replication factor of three, uh, so far in our experience, we haven't observed any hardware related data loss for chunks uh, with that high replication levels. Uh, but unfortunately, through our history, yes, we had a couple of incidents uh, uh, when we were losing some negligible number of chunks, like hundreds of chunks out of billion. Uh, but these losses were due to some either human errors or control plane bugs, for example. So these bad things do happen, unfortunately. So there is no silver bullet here. But uh, but the, the model itself is, is is pretty solid. So we believe that replicating data three times is sufficient. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, replication factor of three implies the ability to correlate uh, a simultaneous, simultaneous failure of two uh, disk drives. But um, what do we actually mean by saying simultaneous failures? Of course, it's just a rough approximation. Uh, and it's, a, it's uh, an approximation of the fact that the second failure happens within a very narrow uh, time span, within a very narrow uh, time frame from the moment of the first failure. So uh, after the first failure occurs and the system hasn't fully coped with the consequence on the consequences of this first failure. It observes the second uh, one, the second drive failing. So saying two failures are enough to tolerate actually assumes some specific rate at which the system could run its self-healing procedures. Um, from what that, from what we observe uh, in large YT clusters, most of the impact uh, coming from a single node failure results within tens of minutes. So like. Uh, a single machine dies, and after 20 minutes, uh, well, there are no after effects, and uh, everything is okay, and uh, all replication levels uh, uh, get restored to normal. And actually, uh, 
the speed at which missing replicas uh, could be re, uh, recreated uh, uh, depends, among other things, on the strategy that you choose for placing chunk replicas. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, you could be just partitioning nodes into groups of size like three and making all nodes within a group identical in the sense that they just uh, hold the same sets of chunks, like the, the same set of data. And with this approach, uh, losing a single node would force uh, the system uh, to create a full copy of the victim. Uh, because uh, data from, uh, by, by, by taking data from two remaining copies and recreating another copy, third copy. So this process cannot run fast since it takes many hours uh, to just make a copy of a single disk nowadays, a single hard drive nowadays. Uh, and it's it's mostly IO bound, uh, bandwidth bound, so to say. So a typical HDD can uh, read or write at rates roughly 100 of megabytes per second. So it takes many hours to replicate a single disk if you are replicating it one to one. And it's just uh, like one extremity. Uh, and the other extremity uh, is to allow placing chunk, chunk replicas independently for different chunks. And uh, this way, uh, we could distribute the cost of repairing the damage caused by node failure across the whole fleet. And uh, this is mostly the way uh, we have chosen to follow in YT. And actually, both approaches uh, have their pros and cons. Well, like, 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 like it <laughs> happens. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I missed this slide. Yeah. So. Uh, for groups of identical nodes, uh, chunk replica management is much easier. Uh, and uh, when you have groups of identical nodes, uh, uh, you get a very predictable data locality, at least in theory. Uh, and uh, as I already mentioned, our approach enables faster data recovery, but it, it requires some more sophisticated metadata storage and uh, chunk re replica orchestration is also harder here. And we still prefer the free placement approach, uh, since faster recovery speed implies just better fault tolerance. So uh, also, and more of a consequence, um, our storage is highly elastic. Uh, you can easily add and uh, remove nodes, and the data will get balanced across them automatically. And, and this is actually not the case when you have group of uh, identical nodes, uh, because you have to be like, um, removing all three nodes, all three nodes at a time, and thinking about how to distribute uh, the chunks from these nodes to other nodes. And actually, uh, hard drives, fa hard drive failures is not the only possible failure you could observe in a large-scale system, because uh, well, uh, clusters are made of some pretty commodity servers. Uh, pretty common types of uh, hardware is being used, and some other parts of nodes might fail. Uh, memory can get corrupted, uh, power supply units uh, can fail, uh, network cards can misbehave, and the whole net network infrastructure actually can misbehave as well. So currently we don't uh, support hot plugs for these drives. Uh, and uh, once a single disk fails, uh, we take the whole node down for maintenance uh, to replace that drive to make sure that uh, it, it's, it's, back, it's back to normal. And this way, the whole node failure for us is uh, no different uh, from a single drive failure. And sometimes you lose groups of nodes. And this is a huge problem for your data safety, actually, because uh, recall that we have replication factor of three as the baseline. And replication factor of three only implies the ability to tolerate two simultaneous node failures. But when the whole rack goes down, uh, you lose uh, tens of nodes at the same time. And uh, also the whole, the whole data center can go down as well. And this typically happens to, due to some global hardware maintenance or power or networks, network links outage, but it happens. So larger groups of nodes can also fail. And um, for clusters uh, whose nodes are located in a single DC, uh, failing in DC renders the whole cluster unavailable and uh, there is just nothing you can do with it. For clusters, uh, whose nodes are geographically distributed. Uh, and this is the default case for the clusters that require to be highly available. Individual DCs are very similar to just racks, like large racks, and uh, their failures are handled in a similar way. 
So how do we handle uh, rec failures? So uh, the way that uh, group or correlated, so to say, failures are handled is by means of the anti-affinity approach. So uh, there is a notion of failure domain. A failure domain is a set of nodes uh, that are actually expected to go down at the same time. Uh, typically because uh, of the existence of some physical single point of failure. Uh, for example, these nodes may share uh, a single top of rack switch or a power bus or something like that. So uh, here we can see an example of some uh, uh, failure domains. We have failure domains for racks, we have failure domains for, uh, for DCs. And, and another, another extreme example is just a single node. A single node is also a failure domain. And the anti-affinity constraints uh, prohibit us from placing too many replicas uh, in the same failure domain. And uh, actually, this is how uh, the problem of uh, multiple failures uh, get, 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 gets, gets addressed. Okay. Sorry, I have some problem with switching my slides second okay I think we have exited uh, the view mode and, uh, okay, thank you. Good, we're back. Okay, we're back. Okay, so uh, this is a slide where I stopped. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, yet again, the anti-affinity prohibits us from placing more than a certain number of replicas within a single failure domain. For example, in our clusters, we don't place more than a single replica of each chunk uh, within the rack. And this effectively turns a rack failure into a single node failure, as long as a fixed chunk is concerned. And particularly, in particular, we could tolerate a rack and a node going down at the same time, because these are just like two nodes uh, for you if you use anti-affinity. And also having racks as failure domains uh, enables you uh, to update your software fast uh, because uh, during these rollouts, uh, you just upgrade uh, your clusters rack by rack. And while you do that, uh, uh, individual nodes, individual racks become unavailable for several minutes, uh, but uh, you can plan your updates to run rack on rack per rack basis without sacrificing data availability. Okay. Uh, now let's discuss the chunk structure. The chunk structure um, is as follows. Chunks are not just solid blobs of data. They're logically partitioned into blocks and there is a spe separate metadata part that describes the chunk, the chunk content. And it also contains pointers to individual blocks acting actually as a local index for that chunk. And block is a unit of write and read operations. And typically chunks contain a compressed data. So Chunk blocks act as compression blocks for the respective compression algorithms. Okay, let's discuss the write and read pipelines for our chunks. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, write pipeline. So, when being written, chunks are produced block by block. Uh, so, clients don't store the whole chunks in memory. And uh, this saves memory space. Recall that chunks uh, can go, can be up to gigabytes in size. And uh, the client has a number of ways to write chunk data to its replicas. It could be forwarding chunk data to the first replica, then this first replica to the second one, and so on. And this is called chaining, and it's actually the preferred way that we use in YT. And alternatively, the client could be forwarding data to all of its replicas. And typically, we don't this. We, typically, we don't use this method. Uh, because it leads to higher network bandwidth usage of clients. And uh, this could cause imbalanced network load. So we prefer chaining. And uh, well, actually, uh, 
there is some theory of how you should write your chunks and there is some practice. So in theory, you need to have three replicas uh, upon writing your chunk and all replicas must be reliably flushed to a persistent medium. But in practice, uh, we tend to relax these constraints. For example, we use this notion of uh, a bloat replication factor or URF uh, and uh, say that, okay, while the client writes its data, it only creates two replicas and the third one just appears uh, at background. And also we sometimes relax the conditions even further and say, okay, uh, you try to write two copies, but it's okay to write just one because of some failures. You could be losing another one. Just write something, just write a single one. And uh, this is the so-called minimum upload replication factor. So just having it equal to one means that just write a single replica and we'll do the remaining stuff uh, at background. And this saves on uh, the write latency. So you don't have to wait for all of your replicas to write everything reliably. And sometimes it's also possible not to use safe data sync uh, if this data is uh, transient in some way or could be reconstructed. And so these are some practical tricks. And of course, the, this should be applied with care because uh, who knows uh, what your data is and uh, uh, how important the data is. And uh, as for the read pipeline, its primary goal is to be able to read data fast. And in case of three replicas, uh, you have something to choose from. So uh, the reader first probes the replicas uh, to see which one is the least loaded and then requests data from this replica. And readers may also, must be also ready to tolerate replica movement in background and be ready to refetch placement metadata once they find it out of date. And for really latency sensitive applications, you could also do a thing called read hedging. So uh, read hedging means that you ask the first replica first, and this first replica is the least loaded one, and wait for some time. This time is uh, like your estimate on how much time you need to, uh, how much time you expect your data to come. And uh, after that period of time, you ask the second replica and just wait for the result that comes first. Okay, now I think uh, we can actually switch to, uh, well, discussing, discussing uh, erasure coding because uh, it's actually the title of this talk. And uh, erasure coding, uh, erasure coding is a scheme uh, where given a number N of data parts, which are just blobs, you can compute some additional key, date, key parts uh, called parity parts such that if you lose some bounded number of parts from these n plus k guys, then the remaining parts are sufficient to reconstruct all of your initial data. So the usual application can also be regarded as a degenerate case of erasure coding scheme. When you have just n equal one, you have one n data part, and all of your parity parts are the same as your, as your data part. And once you have these n plus k parts, they are identical, so uh, G equals uh, to one. So just any part is enough to reconstruct everything. But it's obviously a degenerate case. And uh, in practice, uh, erasure coding uh, works uh, in a much more complicated way. And the math uh, beneath this, uh, um, this uh, coding is uh, as follows. So most erasure coding schemes uh, uh, rely on coding theory. And uh, we assume that parts are sequences of uh, words, so to say, and uh, words are just elements of some finite field. And uh, for erasure coding, you do, as you do the following. Uh, you scan through all positions of your data, data parts, and uh, for n given words, you, can, you compute k additional words, parity words, uh, such that any g of these words are sufficient for full reconstruction. And here, uh, actually, math comes in and uh, like decoding these missing words is essentially uh, a reconstruction of a polynomial from given values of given points. And uh, well, due to lack of time, uh, I'm not able to go into the details because it's just coding theory, but uh, these details are not very, are not actually very important here uh, because uh, we already use some, uh, some existing libraries to, uh, to, to, solve, to solve the problem. So one of the popular erasure coding scheme uh, is uh, Reed-Solomon codes. And uh, 
For these codes, n and k could be almost arbitrary. And in practice, words are just bytes. Uh, fortunately, there are 256 byte values, uh, which is 2 to the power of 8. And uh, so bytes can actually be regarded as elements of a finite field. And addition and, subtract and subtraction in this field, and it's interesting, can be done by bitwise XORs. So like when you see 3 plus 11 equals 8, you should understand that this is uh, actually XOR, uh, not, not actual plus. Uh, but uh, multiplication is hard, as one needs uh, to run some polynomial arithmetic, and division is no easier as well. So 2 times 2, I don't know the answer. I have to look at the table to, to see what, what happens there. So there are, some, there are several open source libraries for its element coding, and one to mention is Gerasure, and another is ISA L. And uh, the, A, the, late, uh, the latter actually comes from Intel, and it employs some uh, SIMD instructions uh, for finite field operations. And most processors can support these instructions, so there is no actual problem here. Okay. So. Uh, Erasure coding takes data parts, uh, not chunks. So let's discuss how these parts uh, could be formed. Uh, actually, oh. yeah. so uh, let's discuss how these parts could be formed from a chunk payload. And uh, there are two ways, and they are drastically different. Uh, you could divide your chunk payload into n parts of the same size, well, adding some padding in case uh, the sizes are not very equal not exactly equal, and then feed these parts into your encoder. And this is called chunk splitting. And uh, this, uh, the drawback of this scheme is the need to see the whole chunk in advance. Uh, you need to see the whole content before you can proceed with encoding. And in other words, you cannot encode chunks in a streaming fashion. And, uh, but this works best for batch workloads where you have no hurry, where there is no hurry, and you can afford to keep the whole chunk in memory uh, while encoding it. Okay. And another approach is chunk striping. Um, here you look at byte positions in your chunk and take residues modular n, and then you distribute bytes evenly across parts, like indicated in this picture. And so that every nth byte of the chunk goes to the same part. And this could be done without knowing the chunk size of the whole, the, the chunk as a whole, but uh, so it might look preferable. But uh, the major draw side of striping uh, comes from the chunk um, data access patterns. Um, because typically you don't need the whole chunk to be read, but you need just a single, some range uh, of its data to be read. And striping, however, turns a range of chunk offsets into n ranges of uh, offsets in all of its data parts. Uh, hence, you can never read a single range by consulting a single replica. You always need all of them, and this makes your system susceptible to performance hotspots, for example, and uh, can cause your latest details to, to, to rise. And uh, for erasure-coded blob chunks, we use splitting. We don't use striping due to these reasons. But striping turns out to be a very useful idea anyway, and we'll talk uh, on, on this later. Okay, and, oh. Oh. Okay, so when a node goes down in the cluster, masters notice this fact and detect some, that some erasure-coded chunks uh, are now missing some of their parts. Uh, so masters spawn erasure jobs, so to say, at nodes, and jobs fetch the live parts via network and run the erasure decoder to store the resulting repaired parts, recovering, uh, from, recovering from a data loss uh, uh, well, it, it, recovering from like uh, data loss here is fast because uh, the whole fleet can actually participate in the repair process. And uh, uh, like I said earlier, uh, and here it applies as well, recovering from the loss of a single node takes roughly tens of minutes to cope with. And uh, this is a really good timing. It's pretty low timing. And as for the readers, uh, they may either wait for the missing data to become repaired uh, by, by jobs spawned by the master servers, or alternatively, they can uh, uh, run some on-the-fly recovery. 
So they can run the decoder themselves uh, and fetch the existing replicas, the live replicas, and decode the data that they need. And this is called on-the-fly repair. And it's quite useful, actually, because uh, this way you don't have to wait until the data gets repaired in background. And there are a couple of uh, more tricks uh, that are useful here. For example, uh, when an node goes down, typically already there are some readers that need this data right away. Uh, so there may be some hot data. So these readers could be informing master servers uh, that this chunk is missing some of its replicas and we need that chunk. So master servers will prioritize repair of this very chunk. And uh, of course, uh, chunk repair is not very cheap. And, uh, it involves data transfer across network and also disk I.O. So we have a number of throttlers and concurrency limits uh, to make sure that we don't overload the system with just repairs because repair is really, really a resource, cons resource uh, consuming thing and uh, you have to be careful here. And uh, when most of your data is stored in region coded, a node decommission, which is a process where you take a node and try to get rid of all of the data that it carries. So this node decommission actually becomes faster and it's somewhat surprising, but it's uh, the fact because when uh, you have chunk uh, replicas residing on node that you are going to decommission uh, for replicated chunks, uh, chunks that you need to move from that node only have two additional replicas somewhere. And for erasure coded chunks, you have many more replicas. So, well, they are partial replicas, they are just parts. But anyway, you can uh, distribute uh, the cost of decommissioning a single node over more nodes uh, than you would have in case uh, you are using just pure replication. Uh, so we use this uh, trick pretty extensively and uh, decommissioning via uh, uh, data repair is actually the way to go. Okay. So uh, there are actually some other uh, somewhat better uh, erasure codes, uh, but I don't think uh, it's, it makes any sense to discuss them now. I just would like to mention local reconstruction codes that can save on bandwidth, uh, both in terms of uh, I.O. and network bandwidth and are also used in YT. Okay, um, now, um, now actually let's make a short detour and discuss a different story scenario because I think it's, uh, uh, in some sense, it's more interesting. It's narrates data journaling. Uh, so to put this into context, uh, blobs, uh, blo table blobs are immutable and uh, these chunks are like fully static. And uh, thus, you need to have all of the chunk data before writing it out to disks. And your write pipelines for, and the write pipelines for blob chunks are optimized for better throughput rather than latency. But we also have key storages built into YT, and these storages uh, dictate some very different pro priorities. So these storages uh, need some way of storing uh, the sequences of incoming change sets uh, in a persistent way. And these sequences are essentially write ahead logs and the latency of record appends into these logs uh, must be as low as like tens of milliseconds or even lower, uh, as these latencies uh, directly affect uh, the latency of transaction commits. And of course, you could think of the, like packing the change sets into blob chunks, uh, but we just cannot wait uh, until the, the chunk is full before flashing it because it would take seconds or even minutes uh, before you can flush a chunk, before it becomes full. So uh, there is a very different uh, flavor of uh, chunks that we have, of chunk that, chunks that we have uh, in YT. And, uh, and these are called journal chunks. Uh, and it is designed uh, with uh, this very scenario of uh, writing write ahead logs in mind. And, uh, uh, these chunks contain sequences of records, which are just some opaque blobs of small size, typically rather small. And when a record is appended, when the record is appended into this chunk, it re receives a, a certain sequence number. And these numbers don't change. So records can never be reordered. 
And the appended records are being act by the write pipeline. So they're being acknowledged by the write pip pipeline. And when a record is acknowledged, all of its predecessors are also acknowledged. It's a very desirable property for the write ahead logging. And uh, acknowledged records are actually stored reliably. So uh, these must not be lost by storage when some crash happens, uh, because this makes the whole idea with write ahead logging useless. And the system, however, may discard some trading in flight and not acknowledged records that are at the very end, like record number four here in this picture. And the acknowledgement latencies must be low. So we expect tens of, milli tens of milliseconds and even lower latencies. Uh, and of course, the system must be fault tolerant. So it must be able to cope with uh, losses of single nodes, maybe pairs of nodes and uh, things like that. Okay, so uh, journal chunks are implemented by writing a collection of replicas uh, and some important numbers describing their parameters are shown here. So you pick the number of replicas, the replication factor, and you also pick to some, you also pick two additional numbers. These are called read and write quorum sizes. So uh, these three numbers in total must obey this safety property. We say that read quorum plus write quorum must be strictly greater than replication factor. And in terms of combinatorics, uh, this implies that for every read quorum and for every write quorum, there is a non-empty intersection. And we'll see soon why this is actually important. Uh, like a good example is having four replicas uh, writing with quorum of two and reading with quorum of uh, three. Okay, so in the write pipeline, all records uh, that are received from the client are being forwarded to all of the replicas and are being appended to their like tails. And uh, this is done all in parallel and all in the same order. So when the pipe, so when the pipeline observes that write quorum of replicas uh, have successfully flushed some record, this record is considered to be acknowledged. So we wait until the write quorum of replicas says that, uh, well, this record has been flushed. And the client, is, uh, the client gets notified on this. And uh, the write pipeline maintains, uh, so to say, replica consistency. For any pair of replicas, one is the prefix of another. So in other words, if you have two replicas and they both have something at position i, then these records uh, must be identical. But the length of the replicas could be different because it is dynamic process as you write them. And uh, when a failure happens uh, during uh, the write, uh, in this case, uh, the write pipeline just abandons the current chunk and switches to another one. And uh, actually there are some interesting things happening with the record numbers on this switch, but uh, due to lack of time, I'm not able to actually go into the details. And now what about the read pipeline? Um, well, at the first glance, it seems trivial. So it's like all replicas are consistent with each other. So you just could take the longest replica and say, okay, here's my data and let's read the longest replica. But the problem with reads is very different by its nature. Um, if we can read some record, uh, well, it means that this record is present in some and hence in the longest replica. Uh, then it's okay, but uh, this means that if we can read something, then we, we are sure that its content is, is correct. It is exactly what has been uh, written at that position. But what if there is no replica holding some record I? So you want record I, but you don't see any replica with record I. Does this imply that there is uh, no record I at all? Uh, does this imply that this record hasn't been committed? has been acknowledged. In fact, in fact, uh, um, if we have, uh, if we make no, pro mm, in, in, in fact, we make no promises for records that uh, were seen by the right pipeline. So they were submitted by the client, uh, but, uh, but were not acknowledged. But uh, we only make promises only for records that were acknowledged. And so let me state this important fact uh, 
yet again in a different way. The system must be able to distinguish uh, between a non-acknowledged record and the record that uh, was acknowledged but is unavailable for some reason now. So there must be no sudden data loss. Uh, if you can't read something, you must be able to tell your client that it's exactly the case. And if you can read, well, just go, go and read. <laughs> Why not? But fortunately, uh, read and write quorums protect us here. Uh, we can only read a chunk if uh, we see enough of its replicas, read quorum of its replicas alive. And in this case, the longest replica is guaranteed to hold all the acknowledged records because uh, if that record was acknowledged, then we had some write quorum and that write quorum intersects with our read quorum. So the longest replica already has that record. And we can certainly, and sometimes it's possible, read even more records than uh, have been actually acknowledged during the write. But it's okay. So we make no guarantees that we don't read anything besides uh, records that were acknowledged. We can read additional records, but it's okay. Well, now let's analyze the pros and the cons of the journal chunks. Uh, for the pros, uh, these can handle mutable, in fact, append-only data structures. Uh, and at the same time, they provide some uh, safety guarantees. And for, con, uh, for cons, uh, these chunks are much higher, have much higher disk and network uh, bandwidth usage. Uh, for example, imagine you have uh, immutable chunks and you have chosen replication factor of three. Uh, so you achieve uh, two node fault tolerance. You can tolerate a failure of two nodes. Uh, but if you use uh, three replicas and read quorum of two and write quorum of two for journal chunks, then you can only tolerate just a single node failure. Uh, because your read quorum is two, you have three replicas, so just one replica could be lost, not two. So uh, another way to go is to have large write quorums. You say, okay, I'm going with write quorum of three. Now I could have read quorum of one. So this means uh, two node fault tolerance, but um, it's not bad uh, in sense of the write pipeline because uh, from the latency perspective, it's pure nightmare. You have to wait for all of your replicas to acknowledge anything to acknowledge the rights that you make. Uh, waiting for three replicas out of three is a nightmare. And uh, finally, you can actually ac achieve the needed fault tolerance, like being able to tolerate two failures if you write five replicas and choose uh, read and write quorums uh, to be three. Uh, but uh, you see that the replication factor went from three to five. So for immutable blobs, you have three, here we have five. So you have high amplification. And uh, of course it's, uh, it's not a thing to be proud of. Okay, and uh, actually uh, we have a high replication factor, like a replication factor of five. But um, interestingly, storage space here is not the concern because write hail logs are typically rather small and uh, you are mostly bandwidth, uh, um, bandwidth bound rather than capacity bound. Okay. Uh, now comes the final part, I think the most interesting. And now we try to combine uh, the erasure coding with uh, journaling and see how erasure coding could help us uh, to use less bandwidth and at the same time achieve some like uh, good levels of fault tolerance. The motivation is pretty straightforward. Uh, erasure coding promises huge savings of disk space. So it's like, instead of having three replicas, now you have, uh, for read Solomon, you have 1.5, so to say, replicas. So you have huge savings on disk space, but uh, this implies you also have huge savings on bandwidth usage. You are not very concerned about disk space, but bandwidth usage is a thing. And this is especially important for SSDs since like flash wear is a huge problem and mid-priced drives don't like when you write much data to it and if you do that constantly with some constant high rates, then your hard drive, your SSD drive, sorry, uh, will, will die pretty soon. So let's write uh, erasure coded journals, shall we? Why not? Uh, well, let's try. Uh, let's try. So, but before we proceed, uh, let us recall there are two ways of producing data parts from raw chunk data. You could either be like splitting chunks or use striping. 
For, blank, for block chunks, we have decided to go with splitting. Since we care about our read performance, uh, and uh, so, as I was explaining earlier, when you have striping, every range request turns out to be like, you have to be contacting every replica because that range becomes uh, striped across all replicas. And um, knowing the whole chunk in advance, which is a prerequisite for, uh, for splitting, uh, is something that we cannot afford here. So, we actually don't have any choice. Uh, we can't use splitting because we don't know the whole chunk in advance. So we have to go with striping and we have to suffer on the read side, so to say. But it turns out to be not a very big problem for write-ahead logs because write-ahead logs are not being, are not being re read constantly. Uh, when you read your write-ahead log, this already means that you're in some sort of trouble. You're trying to recover, replace something. So it's okay to be slower on the read side. And yes, we use striping here. We, we stripe our erasure-coded uh, journals. And now let's look at the definition of quorums for erasure-coded chunks, because quorums here are much stricter, so to say. And uh, some peculiar differences come into play here. We shall be using uh, Reed Solomon as uh, like the very basic code that can be used here. And uh, let there be n data parts. So we have n data parts and k parity parts, and uh, we shall be using this notation of replication factor, which is n plus k, but uh, please remember that these are not the actual replicas, they are just parts. So they are not identical. It's not that like you're storing uh, many copies of something. And uh, now the safety invariant for erasure coded journals uh, looks similar but different. Uh, so for replicated journals, we were saying that our read quorum plus our write quorum must be larger than our replication factor. And here we have a, a somewhat similar but a different bound. And one can easily notice that the sum must be larger. Uh, this is because uh, the right-hand side actually declares the needed size of the intersection. So the larger your right-hand right right -hand side is, the larger your intersection must be. And this is because if you have just uh, one replica in the intersection, recall that these are not actually replicas, they're just parts. So you have just single part, you cannot get anything out of it. You need more parts. You need at least N parts to be able to recover. So this way, uh, instead of uh, a replication factor, you have replication factor plus N minus one. And uh, okay, uh, now, here are some possible, like, uh, so to say, uh, oh, 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 no, 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 too fast. Okay, uh, here's an example of some uh, like practical scenario uh, that you might face. Uh, suppose you recorded journals with Reed Solomon. You have three uh, data parts, you have three parity parts, so in total you have six parts. Now let's choose some write and read quorums. A pretty good choice is write quorum five, read quorum of four because it could tolerate up to two not failures. Uh, recall to compute the number of failures yet that you are able to tolerate, you just take uh, number of replicas minus uh, read quorum. So these, these parts could be lost, it's okay. Uh, while you still have four parts, you're okay. So you can tolerate two failures. And when you're writing, you don't have to need for, for the whole fleet of replicas uh, to be act. Uh, because uh, right, fact, uh, right quorum is five and replication factor is six. You are waiting for five out of six. And the bandwidth overhead here is uh, times two because uh, you start with some data, split it, stripe it actually into three parts and compute additional three parts of the very same size. So the overhead is uh, times two. And previously we were able to achieve uh, two node failures uh, uh, two node failures tolerance, uh, but using a much higher bandwidth overhead, like times five. So this promises some huge savings on bandwidth. But uh, let's look at this picture and try to understand why our read quorums and write quorums are actually safe. So we have six replicas. Suppose we were, you were writing some data. Uh, so this guy is actually trying to read, I think, oh no, this guy is trying to understand why these two first replicas failed. Uh, for no reason, they just fail. 
So uh, the write pipeline was writing data as, as you can see, records from uh, with numbers 0, 1, 2, 3 were actually successfully acknowledged. So five replicas are storing uh, this, uh, this piece of data. And re record number four was not acknowledged because we only have uh, three parts uh, uh, with, uh, with, with this data. So uh, when it comes to reading, uh, you have read quorum of four, and uh, you have these four replicas here. And as you can see, you have three replicas with part number three. And for read Solomon uh, with these parameters, with parameters three plus, plus three, you can decode uh, the, whole, the, the whole blob from any three of its parts. So record number three could be actually decoded here. And if you do some math, you can uh, uh, make sure that uh, it's not just some picture, uh, it actually, the way it works uh, in some general scenario. Okay, and uh, um, in the remaining couple of minutes, uh, I will try to show you uh, some, some pretty low level engineering uh, stuff uh, that can happen to you when you try to apply the libraries that you just download and hope that everything will work as you expect it to work because uh, you have just read a book on erasure coding or coding theory or read Solomon or anything. Uh, so uh, for example, suppose you give the following data parts to read Solomon uh, encoder. So you have six data parts and we'll be constructing three parity parts. Each part consists of uh, same byte value repeated many, many times. So like zeros, ones, twos, threes, fours, and so on. And what, would you, what you would expect is to get three data parts. And of course, these three data parts are expected to be uniform because as we were uh, saying earlier, for each byte position, you just uh, look at uh, the corresponding values in your data parts and compute uh, three additional bytes. And since uh, all these uh, all these positions uh, hold the very same byte values, uh, the the parity parts are also expected to be uniform in their values. But uh, well, you run it with Gerasure, and what you get is a very strange pattern here. So as you can see here, the first parity replica is roughly what would you expect. We don't know what the value actually must be, but well, some value. But uh, the remaining two parity parts show some non-uniformity. Uh, and it's actually due to the implementation details of Gerasure. It does some bit twiddling tricks and it somehow rearranges the data, it's some padding. So it's not uh, the pure read Solomon code actually uh, because of the way it is implemented internally. And this is a problem for us uh, because this means that while reading, you must be following the very same ranges that you were using while writing. So you just cannot take some sub-range of the uh, data in the encoded form, read it, apply the decoder and say, okay, this is my decoded data. Because uh, the, de the, the decoder depends on the offsets. It not only depends on uh, the values it's themselves, it, it, also, it is also dependent on the offsets or in some way. But fortunately, there is a way to uh, overcome this uh, oh, the overcome this difficulty. You should just use ISA-L. For ISA-L, uh, we examined its code base, we did some tests, and it's a pure read Solomon uh, encoder. So the byte values of the parity parts only depend on byte values of the data parts, not on the position itself. So you could actually be decoding uh, within ranges that do not align with ranges that we're using during uh, your writes. And it's a very good thing because uh, this way you don't have to be worried about how you batch while write and how you uh, read and uh, do you align these two things. Okay. So uh, in practice, we use ISA-L for uh, erasure coded journals and uh, also isa -L is just faster. So what could think, why would we need uh, Gerasure at all? Well, uh, Gerasure was used to store our data prior uh, to the moment when we, we have switched to ISA-L. 
So we already have some data encoded with Gerasure. And as you can see from the previous example, the internal layout and the internal format of these two encoders. Uh, uh, so these, these two formats are different. And you cannot just run ISA L for data that, it, that was encoded uh, with, uh, with Drasure. So we still have uh, Drasure in our code base and we still use it for some legacy chunks, so to say. And much of our data is being stored in, uh, in Drasure. But for newer chunks, we can, uh, uh, we can benefit from ISA L and, and that's good. And some final comments on the cross DC case, because uh, when you write right ahead logs, uh, Sometimes you do that in cross DC uh, setting. Uh, for example, you have three data centers and you would like to apply these ideas. And Reed Solomon uh, 3.3 works nicely for three data centers because you can just place six replicas uh, in two plus two plus two combinations. So you have two replicas in every data center and any two nodes can go down simultaneously. And actually any data center can go down as well because it only holds like two replicas. So you have single DC failure and two node, uh, single DC failure tolerance and uh, two node failure to tolerance, uh, which is nice. And another nice thing to mention is that you not only save on the disk IO bandwidth, but you also save on the network bandwidth. And for cross DC links, uh, this bandwidth is really expensive because uh, the links are uh, very limited in their like rates and rate capacities and uh, building links that uh, enable you to transfer like petabytes per second is just an, has enormous costs. So you don't want that. Uh, so you not only save on disk bandwidth, you also save on cross DC network bandwidth, which is a good thing. Okay. Um, now we come to conclusions and well, I'm, I've got some conclusions, but uh, uh, so firstly, I think uh, our experience showed that erasure coding uh, is a schema that you can apply and it will most certainly work nicely for you, at least for your code data. Uh, because um, uh, having less actual replicas also means uh, you could be suffering from some performance issues, especially in terms of the latencies, you could have some hotspots. Uh, but uh, designing your system carefully, you can almost uh, completely defeat these problems. So uh, you also need some safeguards, you need some throttlers, you need some concurrency limits because otherwise your cluster could easily be just doing erasure decoding uh, due to losses and overloading individual nodes and running into this like uh, cascaded failure scenario where you overload one thing and then it crashes and uh, now you've got uh, even more losses you have to cope with. So you have to be limiting uh, those things, especially when talking about cold data because cold data, uh, typically it's okay to wait for some time before it gets uh, recovered, before, it's get, before it gets repaired. And uh, finally, regi coding uh, not only offers uh, huge savings on disk space, which is good if you are talking about, uh, if you're thinking about storing petabytes, even petabytes and exabytes. Uh, but it also pr provides some uh, good savings on bandwidth, uh, which could be essential if you are talking about cross DC replication, or if you are thinking about writing your data to SSDs, which suffer from this uh, wear problem. And uh, okay, uh, I think uh, that mostly concludes my talk. Uh, Roma, are you here? I'm here. Uh, there were okay, some questions uh, yeah, during your talk. Uh, yeah, actually, you answered like half of them uh, by the talk themselves, <laughs> but there is one question that you didn't. Uh, there's a few still left. Um, uh, one is that can you please elaborate a bit how you uh, actually detect uh, that uh, nodes are, you know, oh. lost or corrupted? Okay, okay. Like, yeah, or sure. do you use like Merkle trees or can they even be used? No, we don't use Merkle trees here. So we have this control plane that keeps track of everything that goes uh, in our cluster. We have uh, uh, servers that receive product heartbeats from our nodes. And if there is no heartbeat, heartbeat within, a, within several minutes or so, then we declare this node dead. And uh, actually tuning these parameters uh, is, a, is a bit tricky story because 
if you instantly believe uh, half of your cluster is dead because of some overload, then you start repair and this adds to that overload. And, uh, but we did some research and I think we have uh, came up with the, with the parameters for our heartbeats that are pretty reliable. And also we actually uh, uh, quality of service in our network uh, to make sure that our control plane is somewhat, uh, somewhat independent of our data plane. So you don't overload your system with data to the extent that you're no longer being able to receive heartbeats. Uh, so this is how it works. Okay, uh, there, there is another interesting question. Yeah, uh, is, do I you... see a good question actually from uh, Danila. Yeah, so um, uh, four, four kilobyte alignment. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so five kilobytes is too much uh, because uh, uh, remember that these four, four, four kilobytes is the size, I think it's the size of uh, the record in terms of the replica. So we have like six, six replicas, six parts. So in terms of the original size, that would be, I think, 12 kilobytes. And typically, uh, Red Hat Log uh, records are much smaller. So by padding them, uh, you actually increase your bandwidth usage. And we actually would like to work uh, at level of not maybe not bytes, but like uh, uh, eight of bytes. And uh, of course, uh, four kilobytes is a, is a huge padding. And it's one of the reasons why we have chosen to use ISO L, besides it being just faster. Uh, of course, you can do something with Gerasure. It's not just uh, some random permutation of your your data and the position. It's it's predictable, yeah. But uh, we don't want to be bothering with uh, this alignment at all. And for ISA L, it's not a problem at all. So uh, there's also this question of whether you try to use uh, Eurasia coding for any kind of network protocol, not just for storage. Maybe uh, um, to you know yeah, to that's increase. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, actually, not uh, not yet. Uh, so to say, Eurasia coded journals is our first attempt. Uh, but we could we could actually think of extending these ideas to just network communication. But but so far, uh, uh, erasure coded journals uh, is the only thing I will be discussing here. Uh, there is so a question about rough leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah so other, leader our leaders are uh, our, our bottlenecks in your system. Yeah, so. Um, Raft is completely independent on uh, erasure coding, so Raft leaders don't do any erasure coding. We have this separation of control plane and data plane, and Raft only acts in the control plane. And uh, so uh, there is no connection between Raft and uh, erasure coding. Uh, so there are some bottlenecks, CPU bottlenecks, but the, uh, these are mostly due to the fact that we have plenty of metadata, and that's why we shard that metadata. Uh, but uh, using erasure or not using erasure, it's, it's, must, it no, it's mostly irrelevant to the metadata plane. Metadata plane only needs to know uh, what your encoding scheme is, of course, but uh, it doesn't deal with data on its own. Yeah, uh, there was another question before, like, do, do, do you have this talk anywhere in Russian or is it exclusive for Hydra? Russian, yeah. No, uh, not not yet. <laughs> okay, so that's 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 I think that's that's all I've noticed uh, in the questions, uh, and um, it looks like we're are uh, will be uh, uh, running out we'll of time. To the discussion zone, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the there is a link in the chat of where where, where we can uh, we mm -hmm. can talk in the uh, discussion zone. So any okay. further okay. questions, you can welcome. All participants are welcome to join discussion if they they, they have any other questions. Uh, be welcome uh, to ask them in discussion zone. Uh, okay. okay, gentlemen, uh, to join our uh, a couple of words for our attendees first. Uh, to join the discussion zone, just push Zoom button on the web player, follow the link, and uh, Roman and Maxim will join the, this uh, discussion room in Zoom like during the next couple of minutes. Uh, Maxim, thank you very, very much for your talk. 
And Thank you. Roman, thank you very much for the support. Uh, small, just just a, a couple of small questions to you, Maxim. First, uh, is uh, my understanding correct that that use you know unique talk for Hydra? Uh, to some extent. <laughs> yeah, because you mentioned that you know, but d never did the talk uh, in Russian, probably, or I did some talks in Russian uh, describing like. Uh... I was giving some uh, talks describing the architecture of YT um, to some extent because uh, the system is really huge and uh, there are many parts, uh, there are many interesting parts like the compute part which is completely missing uh, in this talk. Um, but these were just some overviews and I think uh, this is uh, the deepest, so to say, talk that I had uh, over the last years. Uh, describing some uh, technical details in, uh, in in particular. Yeah, that's very cool because our audience uh, really love some, you know, uh, deep details of how some system works. And a a another one is maybe m more personal question. Uh, mm -hmm. In the very beginning of the talk, uh, Roman mentioned that uh, you are uh, ICPC guy, correct? That's right, yeah. Uh, could you please say a couple of words about your ICPC experience and how oh, do you yeah. relate to this community? Uh, so, so, <laughs> so I was participating in ICPC when I was a student and um, I was with the Moscow State University team and uh, we, had, uh, we had two chances to go to the World Finals and we had two medals there. Uh, wow. The first one was bronze, the second one was gold. And wow! Our best result was the second absolute place, and uh, among other among my teammates were uh, Piotr Mitrichev, who is a oh, very, yeah. very, very famous guy uh, yeah. in, in this, this area, world, yeah. and also Eugene Chiripanov. Uh, uh, so they both now work in Google, and uh, they're my very good friends. And uh, so, so hello. Very <laughs> you see me, yeah. So probably uh, you know that uh, the last couple of times, the 2018, 2019, uh, Moscow State University won the yeah. finals. Yeah. And yeah. this year, uh, the plan was to have a finals in Moscow. Yeah, I know but that. But yeah. due to the COVID situation, yeah. we have to <laughs> move the, the finals to probably the next year or to the end of this year, who knows, and probably in uh, the next year we'll have two finals that's like <laughs> that's, that's very unfortunate actually yeah that's because very interesting. i was uh, i was very uh, disappointed to to know that yeah. uh, this is actually happening okay yeah. uh, raman the last question uh, to you is to you so uh, do we have chances to have finals in moscow in yeah the well they will be no not not in this year i mean they will be physically like early early next year ah, i mean okay. there's uh, there's little chances the international travel will be fully restored in the next ah, okay. months. so i mean uh do, but do, 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 do you have any ideas to make finals like distributed or uh yeah no that's that's kind of spoils the whole idea the world finals is not just a competition it's a community when people gather meet so i mean it's uh it's uh, it's really important to bring people together. Uh, it's yeah. uh, so we do, do do really want it uh, yeah. to us in one place. But probably ICPC should follow Hydra twenty twenty way and move online. Who knows? Uh, there's already been an online event, by the way. Uh, I mean the the day zero that uh, you know, gathered some good speakers and uh, you know community. But it's it's not the it's it's good, but it's not 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 replacement. Okay. Thank you very much, folks, uh, for the session, and uh, Thank you. go go to Zoom and see you a bit later. Okay. Great. Thank you. Bye.